All right, for the rest of us, um, pull out your Bible and turn to, toward the back, Revelation chapter 4. And that's okay if you just have it on your phone, you can use that. Revelation chapter 4 is where we'll be talking through today. Before we get to, to Revelation 4, and I will read it to you when we get there, um, I want you to know today is the final day of this series called Churches of Revelation Reflecting the Light of Christ. The title today is A Review and a Now What? Now what do we do? After chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, um, also, I want you to know that inside your bulletin is a table that shows all the notes that I created when I did this message with all the churches, and some of you probably didn't pick them up, and there's extras on your way out. You can grab one on your way out if you want that. But I did promise when we got into Revelation that I would spend a little bit more time explaining some terminology so that we all understand what we're talking about. So I want to start out with an overview of eschatology. Sounds like a big word, doesn't it? Eschatology. Well, if you break it down, it's really made up of two Greek words, and I'll focus on the last part first, the ology part, the O-L-O-G-Y. Ology just stands for the study of. It comes from the Greek word logia, which means the study of. And then the first part of eschatology comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last or extreme, the end of time as we know it. I want to give you some other examples. So if you hear the word theology, and with ology we know it's the study of, and we look at the beginning, theo. And the Greek word for God is theos. So theology is the study of God. Uh, most of us in, had to have a class in high school, and a couple here even went to college and spent a lot of time looking at this. But the word biology, right? So now you know that means the study of, because it has ology on it, Bio, which is Greek for life, the study of life, biology. So it's not really that tricky when you hear these big words. They're just trying to describe um, what, what their meaning is. So eschatology then is the study of eschatos, the extreme end of time, the study of end times. That's what we have been doing uh, since January, going through chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Revelation, and today we'll look at 4. So one of the words that I want to make sure people are comfortable with is the word rapture. Rapture is an eschatology word. And in your notes, I've got scriptures that you'll want to look up and read them later um, later this week. But before he establishes his kingdom on earth, Jesus will come for his church, an event that is commonly known as the rapture. At the rapture, the dead in Christ will be raised to receive their resurrection bodies. So those who are going to be with God for all eternity receive their resurrection body, even though they have died they are no longer living and breathing as we are today. They will be raised first. And then, if Jesus comes before we're done with church here, we will go. And we will be changed. We will be changed into our resurrection body, but we will not die. So we will move in to that next phase without dying. That is called the rapture. And we will meet Jesus in the air or in the clouds, as some uh, translations read it. This expectation is our motivation today, church, for holy living right now. To endure patiently 
right now. And the promise of the rapture provides a source of comfort because we have a blessed hope, a blessed hope that Jesus will indeed come for us and we will receive a rapture body similar to the one Jesus has that he got that first Easter that's coming up soon we're going to celebrate. All right, another word or phrase, phrase that I want you to know about is the judgment seat. Jesus at his judgment seat. All Christians are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not to be confused with the great white throne judgment. We'll talk about that next. But the judgment seat of Christ is referred to in Romans chapter 14. During the future sequence of events that we call the rapture, a shocking contrast is going to erupt, interrupt the initial celebration in heaven. And Jesus Christ will sit on the judgment seat and every believer will stand before the judgment seat in their resurrection body to give an account of themselves. This is only for the church. The participants at the judgment seat of Christ are members of the New Testament church. And those of you that are believers right now, that's you. These are people who have trusted Christ as Savior from the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church age, until the coming of Christ during the rapture, the end of the church age. So this is for Kenansburg Church. What are we going to be judged for? Why is there a judgment seat? Since sin was already judged at the cross, that is not going to be judged. And salvation has already been determined by what we think of Christ. The judgment seat will be an opportunity for all of us, for each believer to be rewarded for the things that you have done through the power of of the Holy Spirit. The things that you have done when you walk in fellowship with Jesus and are filled with the Holy Spirit. And Christ will, will judge all the rest, which becomes like wood, hay, and stubble get, that gets thrown on the fire. But instead, we get jewels for our crown based on what we've done through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Again, you are not being judged for salvation. We have already been atoned for by the blood of Jesus. So now let's talk about this great white throne judgment. It's in Revelation chapter 20. Those who don't want to listen to you share about Jesus and what salvation is like to live for all eternity with God, they are going to die without Christ. And guess what? They're going to be resurrected also. They think they got away with something, but no, they didn't. They're going to get a resurrection life that will last for all eternity. And they will stand before the great white throne for judgment. Those who do not have their name written in the book of life, remember the book of life will be the ones that are going to be before the judgment seat of Christ earlier. This great white throne judgment comes at the end of the millennium. And the people that are standing before them without or in their resurrection body will not be found in the book of life. But in Revelation 20, it says there's a whole bunch of books and in those books are written the account of each person. And each person will stand there before Jesus and try to explain to them how they match up to the perfection of Jesus Christ and why they should be able to be in heaven with God. Unfortunately, everyone is born with an old sin nature and none of us can live up to the standard of Jesus. So they will then be thrown in to the lake of fire 
which is the second death. If you recall, earlier we talked about you don't need to worry about the second death. Jesus was telling one of the churches, I'm sorry, I don't remember which one that was, <laughs> but one of the seven churches. The second death is the lake of fire for those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they will be in the lake of fire for all of eternity without God, without God. In contrast, those of us that are in the book of life, we get to move on to Revelation 21 and 22 that you can read later this week also that explains the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and the place that we will reside for all eternity with God. Okay, so that's our eschatology lesson for today. Now let's move on to the chart that I talked about I don't have one right here in front of me, but it's a colored chart um, inside your bulletin. And you'll see that across the top, it'll have each of the name of the seven churches. And each name is a different color, and that color then is in the column. So it goes, everything under that name goes with that church. So right underneath the name is the chapter and verses for the church that describes what happened to that church. And then you will have a box that will have the praises from Jesus. You will also have the grievances from Jesus. And you will have the counsel. That's okay. Thank you very much. You can hand it to somebody who doesn't have one, though. Right up here. Right up here. So the counsel of Jesus and then also the rewards that Jesus has for that church. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And Jesus says, after we look at each one of those churches, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And last week, we also considered where Kenansburg Church might fit into that chart. You know, what would Jesus be saying to us Today, what I want you to seriously consider is what might Jesus be saying to you? Can you personally relate to one of these churches? Read the name of the church. Read the one or two words that we use to describe that church. Are you struggling? Do you reflect the struggles of a church? Or are you an overcomer? Are you moving toward our promised heavenly rewards? If you are, if you are an overcomer, you are helping Kenansburg Church also move into the future to make a difference for God's kingdom. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So now what? Well, Let's look in Revelation chapter 4. I just feel like we have to get into 4 after the churches because look at how it starts out. After this, meaning after Jesus said, to this church right, to that church right, after this, I looked, I as John, who was getting the revelation from God, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me, like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, John said, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald, encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne 
Seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in the front and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings, day and night. They never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. After Jesus provides assessments of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, chapter 4, moves us into the throne room of God. It's a huge shift in this book that we call Revelation. We see in Revelation 4 that the first words John hears are worship. And he sees that the highest order of angels and the best of the redeemed humans bow before God on his throne. Chapter 4 moves us to apocalyptic literature. Apocalypse comes from the Greek word apokalupias, meaning revelation or disclosure. Apocalypse, the revelation. This literature in this book is apocalyptic. It is revelation, unveiling the end of time. As you read the rest of Revelation, you will see visions and symbols representing realities of the future. Let's look at verse 1. After this, following the assessment of the churches, Jesus lifts the veil. He tears open that veil between earth and heaven so that John could see in. And Jesus said, come up here and I will give you a vision of heaven. Before you read any further into the book of Revelation where you can view evil and devastation, chapter 4 gives us a vision of heaven where we see beauty, holiness, and worship. This is what we are seeking, Kenansburg Church. We have commissioned a transition team to help assess the health of this church. And each person sitting here right now and online with us today or when you hear this, you can become a part of this transition team simply by praying that God will open the ears and the hearts of the transition team and bless their work. They will seek God's still quiet voice regarding the reality of where we are as Kenansburg Church. And I suspect that they will identify more praises than what I shared last week and probably more grievances than what I shared last week. They will seek counsel from Jesus to make recommendations to lead Kenansburg Church forward in the kingdom of God. 
and toward our rewards in heaven. Verses 2 and 3 in chapter 4. If you ever wonder what the throne room of God might look like, here is a description. It may be difficult for any of us to truly picture Jesus on the throne by anyone's description. John, from the first century, is trying to do that for us. He was in the Spirit, and he saw it with his own eyes, and he was trying to explain extra-dimensional realities of heaven in terrestrial terms for us in his day and for today. It had to be a challenge. Can you imagine if Jesus just would have taken John and plopped him into our world today, and John had to describe to the first century people what it's like to live in 2024. Can you imagine? How could he possibly describe these remote-controlled drones that are flying around? Or how could he describe a cell phone where you look in a box and there's a person in there and you can talk to them and they talk back to you? But John was actually in the throne room of God. And he's trying to describe for us what he saw. So in verse 3, he said, the one on the throne was like Jasper. Jasper is green. Now, I don't think he knew we were going to be talking about this on St. Patrick's Day. But he saw green. And it's interesting that green is the last stone on the Levitical breastplate. You can read about this in Exodus 28. The Levitical priests had special garments that God told them they should wear. And on their garments, they had these uh, line of stones. And the last one was green. So John might have noticed that when he saw the throne. But apparently, this jasper was clear. Clear like a diamond. And I get that from Revelation chapter 21, uh, verse 11. And then he said, and it also looked like carnelian, or your translation might say ruby. Either way, it was red. And it's interesting, from the Levitical priesthood, on their breastplate, the first stone on their breastplate was red. Ruby red. We could say that these gems might represent Jesus Christ our Lord as the beginning and the end, as he said in chapter 1. As the Alpha and the Omega, he could be saying, I am the red and the green, the first and the last. The ruby can also signify the stain of sin and the purity of God. God takes us from our worst state, and by the blood of his own son Jesus, he turns us pure, washes us white as snow. And then it says in verse 3 that around the throne is a greenish rainbow. Now we don't know if that rainbow was at the bottom of the throne on that clear floor that he talks about, kind of like a rug, or maybe it was circling around the top of the throne. Or maybe it looked like a rainbow in the sky, like John was used to seeing. We don't know, but John said it looked like a rainbow around the throne. And then in verse 4, John sees 24 thrones around in this throne room. Those who sat on the thrones were dressed in white, and their heads were adorned with golden crowns. We call them the 24 elders. Probably, they probably represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. If they did, that would be like the completion of all God's chosen people, the Old Testament and the New Testament. This would represent all of the redeemed of all time, before and after Jesus Christ. Yet the scripture gives us no name, so we really don't know. Just a description that they're clothed in white and they have crowns on their heads. 
The white clothing would represent the purity because of their belief in Jesus Christ. All those who are baptized into Christ are clothed in Christ. Come, that's what we learn in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Do you, do you remember when Jesus told that lukewarm church of Laodicea to purchase white garments? Remember, they, they thought they were great clothiers and they were making all kinds of cheap clothes. And Jesus said, you don't realize everything in your life you need to come and ask me for, and I will provide you. And I will provide you with white garments. Rather than just thinking you can clothe yourself in whatever. In other words, don't clothe yourself in man-made righteousness. Come to me for righteousness, Jesus said. In Revelation chapter 19, we also learn in verse 14 that the armies of heaven are going to be wearing white linen. White in the Bible always symbolizes purity. White, purity. These 24 elders also had gold crowns on them. These were like the type of crowns given to a victor at the Roman games. They're also the type of crowns that symbolize our reward that we get at the judgment seat of Christ. The crown symbolizes reward and authority. As a reminder from the seven churches, the overcomers in Smyrna, remember that? They received the crown of life. And the church in Philadelphia was counseled by Jesus to maintain their crown, their crown of righteousness. So then we move on to verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. So all of a sudden, John's attention comes right back to the throne. Our focus turns back to the throne of God with these rumblings and peals of thunder which could also mean voices. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, one of the four living creatures cries out with a voice like thunder. Thunder and lightning usually signifies some big event from the Bible. In Old Testament, Exodus, thunder and lightning accompanied the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. In the second half of verse 5, before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. We saw seven blazing lampstands in chapter 1 of Revelation with Jesus in the midst of those lampstands. And we talked about the sevenfold spirit of God. Do you remember Sardis Church? Sardis? In Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus refers to himself as him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven spirits represents the perfection and the completeness of the Holy Spirit's ministry, also called the sevenfold spirit. And you can find that described more clearly in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Isaiah 11, 2 describes the sevenfold spirit as the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord the sevenfold spirit of God. The completeness, seven, of the Holy Spirit had been shut out from the affairs at Sardis. And that's why Jesus was writing the letter to them. The lights were on and the people showed up, but the power of the Holy Spirit was missing. But here... After the Kenansburg Church assessment also, we learn that we need to have repentance. 
And following repentance, we become overcomers. And they are the ones, Jesus said, that will see the kingdom of God. The sevenfold spirit of God will be alive and well here at Kenansburg Church if we will just repent and turn back to Jesus. Verses 6 through 8, the living creatures. The vision is similar to Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 15 to 22. You should read those later this week. These are angels. They probably represent the highest order of creation that God created. And they are giving praise to God. Full of eyes suggests that they were incredibly intelligent and insightful. But even these incredible beings that God created are bowing down and worshiping God. Some suggest each face represents a different, a different facet of their ability, like their power or their purpose, the lion versus the ox, and the man versus the angel or the eagle, that they have different powers. We don't know that for sure. Over the years, the churches have surmised that there were different things and they stood for different things. But it's very clear that these are a high order of angels that are bowing down before God. Verses 9 to 11 describes how the angels fall and worship God. And so do the elders from the 24 thrones. Notice, too, that the elders cast their crowns before the throne. The point here is that what things we do on earth, even what merit we receive from Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, that crown that he will give us full of emeralds based on the work that we've done while we were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, we will know without a doubt that it was only done by the Lord working through us. And we will throw our crowns back at our feet, back at the feet of Jesus, saying, Thank you, Lord. You did this for us. It's all you. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. You created us. And by your will, they were created and have their being. So now what? The first words of John that he heard from heaven was praise and worship. That's where we need to be saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. How important is your worship? Who gets the glory in things that you do and your worship to God? As we continue through this intentional interim pastor ministry, Together, we are going to pray for God's impact on the transition team. They will give us a clear assessment of our church health. They will provide recommendations that can help prepare us for our next steps to take action for moving us forward in God's kingdom. As our ministry begins to improve right here at Kenansburg Church, guess what? People are going to be saved. And we will see victories in individual lives and ministry will grow. But we need to be careful. We can very easily start to think that somehow, somehow our own efforts might be responsible. Let us not make that mistake. So now what? Now let's set our sights 
on something much higher than what you see on this earth, much higher than this building on this ground. You come here probably because you really are caught up in the dirt of the day. We live in the dirt of life. But we need to realize that there's something much more and much more real than what we see and what we experience. Jesus is at the door and knocking. The kingdom of heaven is waiting just beyond that door. We do not need to stress out as we leave this building today. Just don't miss out on the glory of heaven. Whoever has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to Kennensburg Church. Worship team, would you please come forward to lead us in our last song while the rest of us all bow our heads and close our eyes in prayer. Oh, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of Revelation. We thank you for your word, for showing us that there is a future beyond what we can even imagine. And that future beyond what we can even imagine, we want to be a part of. We want to be with the angels in your throne room. And we want to make it to chapter 21 and 22 where we will see the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven so that we know where we will live for all eternity with you. All honor, glory, and praise is yours, Heavenly Father. Help us to realize that we only can come to you saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. If there are any that are with us today who don't feel confident in that, who don't feel confident in your future, I would suggest that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've never done that before, please come forward during this last hymn and let me share with you and pray with you that you might receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and the power of, your Holy, of the, His Holy Spirit in you. That's what church is all about. Come, come, Lord Jesus, be our guest today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand.
administrative board meeting in this room over here when we finish. Um, everybody is invited. Like I said, we're just going to be officializing <laughs> a new treasurer, um, but that's going to happen directly afterwards. And then the transition team will be meeting also. So please keep us in your prayers for that. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that the peace that passes all understanding will come down upon us now and comfort us and let us know as we go from here that we are not leaving you, we are not leaving the church, we are part of the family of God, and the Holy Spirit is filling us and empowering us moment by moment, each and every day. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you.